Hi, I'm Art Bergeron and welcome to this month's uh, Elder Law with Frank and Mary seminar. This month is all about income taxes because we're filming this right now um, for showing, um, it's going to be up on our website like forever, but for showing it at, uh, on local cable stations in March of 2022. Uh, so uh, remember we're always talking about my friends Frank and Mary and their kids Peter, Paul and Mary Jr. Um, when I'll, whenever I talk about um, uh, presentations involving Frank and Mary, I'm always talking about kind of a variety of issues. This is tax time, and so you know, you're focused on taxes, but a couple of the comments I'm going to make are really related to Frank and Mary's goals of certainly minimizing their payment of taxes, um, but also structuring things so that if one of them later needs to qualify for Mass Health, the message is name for the Medicaid program, they can do so fairly easily. Now, one of the reasons why I mention that is in, in our, our case here, Frank and Mary's um, uh, assets include an IRA of $200,000. And one of the questions is going to be, so should they be trying to pull that IRA out, that money early, or should they wait? The re one of the reasons why that is relevant is on the, on the mass health side, oftentimes I'm doing planning with folks and, and we're dealing with needing to qualify say Mary goes into a nursing home or, or, or Frank goes into a nursing home uh, and we want to qualify him for mass health and I always tell them well you know the way that you do that is you shift all the assets to Mary in that case uh, and then you have her take some other steps regarding the money but to do that shift Frank would at that point need to cash out his IRA and all, all of a sudden two hundred thousand dollars is going to get added to his taxable income that the taxable income that year which means the tax is going to be higher so one of the parts of the planning that Frank and Mary want to do, if like in this case they're 80 years old, is try to structure things so that if they ever had to do that in the future, the tax hit would be minimal. So we're going to talk about that just, you know, as, as in, once again, the point of the presentation is to really talk about taxes from the perspective of Frank and Mary and their kind of unique tax situation. So first and foremost, I shouldn't say first and foremost, first, do Frank and Mary need to file tax returns? I hear seniors arguing about this all the time. Um, so the basic rule is that the federal rule is that you do have to file a tax return except if only your, if your only income is from Social Security. If that's it, if you have no IRA income, if you have no interest income, if you have no other income, it's just Social Security, then you don't have to file a tax return, right? At the state level, you don't have to file a tax return if your total income exceeds eight thousand, unless your total income exceeds eight thousand dollars, but that doesn't count Social Security. So at the federal level, you don't have to file a return if you have Social Security and have less than eight thousand dollars in other income. But the thing I want to just mention here is the question that often you're often faced with as a lawyer is is, is people will say, well, so what happens if I if I violate the rule, <laughs> right? Uh, and if I just say, well, you know, maybe I have to file a tax return, but what happens if I don't? And the answer is, if Frank and Mary don't file a federal tax return, their only penalty um, is, the, is a, a, an interest on the amount that they would have paid if they had filed the tax return and owed income tax. So if you need, you're supposed to file the tax return, but you know, you know that you're not going to owe anything, well then, you know, what you have to decide for yourself. What are you losing? Are you losing anything by not filing? There's one thing that you do lose, and that's related to the circuit breaker, and we're going to talk about that. But so, <clears throat> if Frank and, so Frank and Mary, the question now is, so do they owe federal income tax? So, to figure that out, it's complicated. Um, Frank's Social Security, you'll remember from the first slide, is $26,000 a year. Mary's is fourteen. dollars they have savings uh, of, of uh, $200,000, so I'm assuming that their interest from their savings is at 2%, actually on the high side these days. Uh, and then they're, they're getting a required minimum distribution through their IRA. Um, so how does that get calculated? And one of the reasons I'm mentioning that is that the magic figure this year would be $9,900 on total IRA assets of $200,000. <clears> the reason for that is that the federal charts actually changed this year regarding this calculation and they changed to reflect the fact that according to the 2020 census people are living longer and therefore the period of time during which Frank and Mary need to be pulling out their IRA uh, or their tax deferred money got extended 
So for this year, regarding money earned in 2021, uh, if Frank was 80, um, the magic factor for figuring out how much he has to pull out is 20.2. That is, they're assuming for these purposes that his life expectancy is 20 years, even though he's 80 years old. I don't want to go into how they figure that out. There is a formula for that, but that's irrelevant to you. The point is, when, it, when you're trying to figure this out, if you don't have a tax preparer, just go to the chart. It's 20.2. The magic number this year is 20.2. So on, uh, on um, uh, a $200,000 IRA, the amount that Frank would be needing to pull out is, is uh, $9,900. So then the question is, what is their, their, their taxable income for federal income tax purposes? To figure that out, you have to go through this other big formula, right? So once again, assume that Frank and Mary are filing jointly and that, remember, Frank had total um, um, uh, Social Security income of $26,000 and Mary um, uh, um, uh, 14. So the to their total income for Social Security purposes is $40,000. So the way you, so when you're trying to calculate whether they owe income tax, you first have to figure out whether any piece of that social security income has to be included in their income. And it does, in some cases, you have to use this formula. First of all, um, you take uh, all of Frank and Mary's social security income, and you take 50% of that. So 50% of 40 is 20. Uh, you then look at what their other total income is, uh, their other total income, their IRA is 9900 9, um, their, their interest is 4000 so their total other income is 139 which means that their total income for purposes of figuring out if Social Security need, any Social Security money needs to be added in is $33,900. Um, you, then, you then compare that number to this other magic number, and once again, these change every year, the, the, uh, the federal number um, that, that you compare that number to for purposes of doing this calculation this year is $32,000. Because they have more than $32,000 in total income using this calculation, the amount of Social Security money they have to report is, is $1,900. Does, <clears throat> does that sound complicated? Yes. That's the reason why you want to have somebody help you figure this number out. Right? The older we get, the less we want to be trying to figure this stuff out. Just you know, talk to one of the folks that does volunteer work through your, through your senior center, talk to an accountant, talk to somebody just to make sure you get this number right. Uh, and remember, that accountant may not even need to do a tax return for you if he can, if, as long as he can figure out for you that you don't need to file a tax return. Okay? So now the question is, do Frank and Mary owe any tax? Well, we take from that previous slide, we take that figure, $1,900. We add to it the IRA income of $9,900, the interest income of $4,000. Total is $15,800. The, uh, the, the federal um, um, standard deduction for a married couple for this year is $27,800, uh, which means they, don't, they are $12,000 below the amount that they would need in order to pay any income tax, $12,000 below. So this answers you a couple of questions. One, uh, do they really want to file an income tax return given the fact that they're not going to owe any tax? Probably not, right? But two, they've also got this extra amount, this $12,000, which they could have earned and still not paid any federal income tax, which leads to the question, right? Don't they want to take that money, that extra, at, at least that amount, at least, the, at least that extra uh, $12,000 and pull it out of Frank's IRA? Because that way, if Frank ever has to cash in his entire IRA, he will have shrunk that pot without having had to pay any income tax. Um, for the fed just to give you a sense of this, the federal income tax rates for this year, if, you make, if you're over the amount that is subject to taxation, then on the first $19,900, you pay 10%. On the next, uh, next amount up to uh, $81,000, you pay 12%. And then after that, there's a huge tax rate jump to 22%. So look at the possibilities here. Uh, if Frank takes an additional distribution of $12,000, he doesn't pay any additional tax. And now he's shrunk that pot of money. Um, from which he might have to take a tax hit in the future. Now, if he takes that extra money, by the way, 
He's got a couple of possibilities. He could certainly take that money and drop it into the, to the, uh, his, his savings account, earning a crummy interest rate, or he could convert that money to a Roth, to a Roth IRA. Remember, Roth IRAs, when you pull the money out of the Roth IRA, you're not paying tax on the, on the, Roth IRA, on the, on the base amount, and you're not paying tax on the amount that, that the Roth IRA grew by. So it's an ideal time for you, perhaps, to be creating that Roth IRA or shifting money to the Roth IRA. Now, once again, that's assuming that Frank just does that $12,000 uh, additional IRA. If he pulled another $19,900 out of that IRA, the, the tax on that would only be, would be, only be $1,990. If he pulled out an additional $61,350, the tax would only be, so I, I kind of went, th went through this. If Suppose he's pulling out money so that he can make sure that he's not paying on any of those dollars at more than 12%, which is really low rate. He could take, uh, he could take in that case, $93,000, $93,250 out of his $200,000, or he could have for last year, paid only $9,000 in tax on it, right? Compare that to what would happen if Frank and Mary, or if Frank and Mary died tomorrow, they were leaving everything to their son Peter, and Peter's doing well. He, in, in the example that we always use, Peter's a lawyer in New York. Just in federal tax, if Peter got that money, he'd be paying about 22%, a 22% rate on that money. So he'd be paying tax of $44,000 versus the $9,000 that Frank would pay by pulling this money out. The reason why I go through that exercise is not is not to like baffle you, but to convince you that you ought to talk to somebody about this stuff. Don't assume that your best course of action is to do nothing. It may be to pull more money out of the IRA, which means by, which means by the way, you needed to have done that by December. So I'm going to make this part of my presentation this year in December so people are going to be aware of it. But there are these other strategies that you, really want, that you may really want to be considering. So, th so that's, that's, that's the first part for in terms of, you know, do you, want to, do you need to file? What's the tax? Do you, do you maybe want to look at strategies to maximize the amount of money that Frank is pulling out of his IRA while still not paying any tax? Um, second, taking advantage of the Massachusetts circuit breaker. Uh, it is estimated that two-thirds of the people in Massachusetts who are eligible for the circuit breaker don't take it. This is just money, this is money that they should be getting from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that they're simply leaving on the table. So let me go through how the circuit breaker works. You decide whether this is relevant for you. As far as Frank and Mary are concerned, remember their house is worth $400,000. Assuming that in 2021, the tax rate on their com in their community was $15 a thousand or 1.5%, that means that their tax, their, their, their real estate tax, was $6,000 in 2021. Assuming um, that they had um, um, water and sewer bills, uh, and, and I'm assuming that their total water and sewer bill for the year was, was, uh, was $1,000, uh, $250 a quarter. I'm just saying that because that's about, I think, what we pay. Um, assuming that, then 50% of their water and sewer bill would be $500. The way that you figure out the circuit breaker is you add up those two numbers. Your total tax bill that was paid in 2021, your 50% of your water and sewer bill that was paid in 2021. Assume that their total was $6,500. Then you compare that to Frank and Mary's income. Now, for purposes of ca calculating the circuit breaker, you, you have to add all of Frank and Mary's Social Security money. Which means, you're set, they're, which means they're to, you're taking their total income, which, which I indicated from the previous, a previous slide, was $53,900. For purposes of the circuit breaker, you take 10% of that number. What's 10% of $53,900? $5,390. To the extent that the amount that you paid in taxes plus 50% of water and sewer is higher than that number, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts will give you a check back. They'll give you a check back for a particular amount of money. If you owed taxes, well, then it's going to get subtracted from the taxes that you owed. If you didn't owe any taxes, they're going to send you a check anyway. 
This isn't simply a credit against your taxes. It's an amount that you can get whether you owe taxes or not. So the credit in this case would be that 6,500 minus 5,390 or $1,110. That's the amount that the Commonwealth of Massachusetts will pay you if you fit into this formula. Now, there is a maximum to the amount that they will pay, which is just slightly higher than that, and this changes every year, which is why I like to go through this every year. This year, or for, or for 2020, for tax year 2021, um, the maximum that they will pay was $1,170. I also want to mention, though, that for people who haven't been aware of this um, and become aware of it now and they say, oh my God, I could have been doing this for, for years. You can also file amended returns for the, pat for the previous two years, for 2020 and 2019, and get credits for all three years this year if you're entitled to this credit. Now, the kicker though is, if you're going to be doing this filing at the state level, you also have to file your tax return at the federal level. That's just so that the state folks can verify how the federal numbers work, okay? So that's the circuit breaker. Now, a couple of other issues that are often relevant to my clients, Frank and Mary, but that Frank and Mary often don't use. First is using the medical deduction in a, in a bigger way. Um, the medical deduction is, a, is an extremely big, can be a really big deduction. Uh, and it is, you can take a medical deduction to the extent that your total medical expenses exceed 7.5% 7, 7 of your federal um, taxable income. And we already figured out what the federal taxable income is or was. So 7.5% um, of that number is a really small number. So you can, you can, this is a big credit, right? Remember that when you're figuring out the medical deduction, that can also include your long-term care insurance premiums as, re as well as any other health insurance premiums like your MedEx, your Medicaid, or your Medicare supplement pay payments. So in, to figure out whether you want to use that deduction, you would take that larger number and compare it to what your standard deduction is, which is $27,800. So it, it, it may be that your, your, it makes a lot of sense to take that medical deduction. You, somebody needs to do these numbers for you. And once again, the person who can figure that out is a tax preparer or an accountant. You don't need a, typically a tax lawyer to figure out any of this stuff, right? This is really straightforward. One of the things you want to really consider, though, is whether in, if you're looking for those kinds of deductions, you can, take advantage of, you can take advantage of using the medical deduction to make your house safer for you if you're having physical problems. Because if you're having those problems, if your doctor says that, that you've got existing medical issues like disabilities, that you're just having trouble getting around, that, that any number of disabilities, um, and that therefore, and that though your situation would be helped by, by making changes to your home, then those changes that you make can be tax deductible. Tax deductible. And now, once again, in Frank and Mary's case, in, um, uh, they're not going to be paying any taxes, so they wouldn't. They, their benefit that would benefit wouldn't occur unless Frank was pulling money out of his IRA, thereby increasing their income and making the tax deduction here more valuable. This could, you know, this could apply if you're thinking of installing some big things like an elevator, or smaller <coughs> things like ramps or grad bars. The, the key is that to the extent that this, these costs do not increase the value of your home, all of, the, all of it is, is considered to be a, tax, a, a, a medical deduction. To the extent that, the, that your home value is increased, then the, it, the increased home value gets subtracted from the total amount that you're spending. The point is, this is the kind of stuff you should be looking, looking at. Um, finally, regarding this issue, remember that the medical deduction can also be used to pay for home care, even though it's not home care that would normally be considered medical. Things like nurses or durable medical equipment. Uh, for example, the biggest home care expense that Frank and Mary may be facing as they're, if they're 80 and over is the, is the, the cost of, of bringing in help, of bringing in help to help Frank or Mary because one of them is having trouble getting around. If that's the case, and if you're a doctor, nurse, or social worker will certify 
that during the year for which you're filing, in this case 2021, um, th that, that, you, th that one of you needed assistance either with at least two of the activities of daily living, which are eating, bathing, dressing, toileting, or transferring, or just needed assistance because you, know, you needed it because otherwise it would have been unsafe for you to be in your home alone. If that's the situation, then the cost of the caregivers that you hire is it can be a medical deduction. Now, think about that, and I'm just using this as a, this is not an unusual case, that Mary has got some physical problems or maybe some cognitive problems and therefore needs some help in the morning, some help making meals, some help showering. Say that that adds up to a total amount of four hours per day. The typical uh, rate for home care workers right now is about $25 an hour. Four times 25 times 365 days in a year that means the total amount that Frank and Mary would be paying for that care is $36,500. All of that could be taken as a medical deduction. Now, do you need all that documentation and the note from the nurse and all that jazz in order to take the medical deduction when you file? No, but you wanna have that stuff in your files in case there's an audit, in case the IRS comes back and says, well, you know, how did you figure that out, right? The point is, you could take that deduction now, even though you had, if, if, these, if, if you met these criteria in 2021, even though you don't have that documentation now regarding from the medical professionals. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip that slide. See, so the next thing I want you to think about, and, and this relates specifically to, to folks who are needing care at home, is the benefit of the medical deduction is going to increase the higher your income and therefore the higher your tax bracket. So what if instead of um, Frank and Mary looking for this medical deduction or if Frank is dead, what, instead of Mary looking for that medical deduction, what if she gave all of her money to the most successful son? We're saying, talking about Peter here, the son that's in the highest tax, tax bracket. And what if he then spent the money for Mary's home care or to buy that elevator or to, to do any of those things. Well, and, and by the way, if, she, if, if Mary had made that transfer to, to Peter of all of her assets or of a lot of her assets, then five years after she had made that transfer, those assets would no longer be countable or lienable if Mary ever needed nursing home care, which if Mary's needing a lot of care at home now, that may very well be what she's worried about or what the kids are worried about. So if she does that, if she transfers funds to Peter, and Peter then uses these funds to provide for his mother's home care, and, if, and for other things for his mother, and if the total amount that Peter is providing for Peter's mother equals more than 50% of his mother's total expenses for that year, then Peter can actually take his mother as a medical deduction. Which, and if Peter's income is substantial, say Peter earns between 80 and 180, $160,000 $160, in 2021, which means that his federal and Massachusetts tax rate were 27%, that means for every dollar that he had paid for that home care and those other things, he's saving 27 cents on his federal income tax return. So he's gonna be getting a substantial amount of money back. Now, if he's the good son, that he should be because that's why Mary gave him all the money, he's probably just gonna keep that money aside, not just pocket it, for his mother. And so it's really increasing the, 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 the length of time during which his mother can really get these benefits. A final thing, a note on gifting. Um, remember, uh, if, you're, if, if Frank and Mary are making gifts to nonprofit organizations, which, for which they could norm, normally take a uh, charitable deduction, <clears throat> excuse me, that's really not gonna be worth anything to them uh, given the income that they have unless they decide to stack their gifts to basically say that in one particular year they're gonna make a lot of gifts as opposed to making small gifts at, at, um, every year. So it may be that that's a strategy they wanna consider. So finally, regarding your taxes, you probably have to file a tax return but uh, under law, except that the penalty for not filing is only a percentage of the taxes you owed. So if you don't owe any tax, you decide whether you really want to file that return. Uh, you may not have to pay much. You may very well qualify for the circuit breaker, but if you do, then you need to file those tax returns. 
keep in mind the uses of the medical deduction to make improvements to your house and remember that, provide, that, that you, you can use the medical deduction to pay for home care as long as you can establish certain criteria which I went through in the presentation. Um, and your successful child, if you give things to your successful child and then that child starts paying for, for, for these things for you, it may very well be that he or she will be entitled to a substantial uh, medical deduction. And finally, think about stacking your, your, uh, not your gifts to nonprofits. I hope this was beneficial. The bottom line is talk to a tax preparer or an accountant to see whether you need to file a tax return this year and to see whether you want to because of the circuit breaker. You may want to talk to him or an elder law attorney about using these medical deductions and other things uh, to, to, to get ready in case you need mass health and also to reduce your tax bills in the shorter run. Thank you very much and uh, we'll talk to you next month.